Hi everybody and welcome to the joint presentation on autism and classical myths, in particular Herculean focus. Um, I'm gonna, I, so it's, it's a joint thing, it's me Susan DC from Roehampton, here I am in my office, um, and also Lisa, do you want to say hello Lisa? Hi Lisa Morris from Barryland in Israel and I'm in my office with the air conditioning on, so it's a much better arrangement. We do have sun outside as well. Yeah, yeah, here I am in, in southwest London where it's all always sunny. Um, okay, so um, it, it's such an honour to take part in this in this event. Um, I was just so delighted to get the invitation from April. Um, hi, April. Um, not least because there's there have already been um, connections between um, a project Lisa and I are very much part of, which we'll be saying more about that in due course, the Our Mythical Childhood Project. Um, under whose wing we're doing some autism work um, and the uh, Children's History Society. Um, and also April has been uh, long been very, very supportive of the work I'm doing on autism and, and children's culture. Um, and also another thing to say is that this, uh, this, um, this, uh, this event is, and uh, this paper that we're given um, is very timely. And in order to demonstrate how timely that is, I'm just gonna switch to, um, to PowerPoint. So I just need to, uh, share screen. Here we go. Um, yeah, so um, one reason it's so timely is that, um, well, uh, a little while ago, Lisa and I, along with our colleague ILX, um, uh, who uh, is Lisa's colleague at Bari Lam, uh, launched uh, a network for anybody who's interested in uh, anything to do with autism and classical myth and the possible connections between the two. It's called uh, Acclaim. I just went to like I just went to confidently change to the next slide and nothing happened. Um, okay, um, and um, as we're as we're giving this joint presentation here, um, our first uh, online event, well, our first ever event, is actually about to take place uh, Monday of next week, the twenty fourth of May. So by the time we're actually you're actually watching this, uh, it'll have taken place, and we can give you some feedback on it if you if you want to. Um, so uh, we launched the we launched the network um, uh, just over a year or so ago in Warsaw uh, at one of the events for the Our Mythical Childhood Project, which is a huge global project, um, ERC funded, headquartered in Warsaw um, with um, various people from around the world involved. Um, I'm leading things here in the UK and Lisa's leading things uh, in uh, in Israel. And you can see here sort of various little icons that, um, that show, amongst other things, you know, our two universities uh, next to one another. And here's the logo of the Armies of the Childhood Project. And um, yeah, the, and this is, this is where uh, myself and Lisa, <laughs> very involved in what we're doing at this point, were, um, were announcing the uh, creation of a claim actually in Warsaw um, at one of the Armies of the Childhood events. And so um, what I'm just going to do briefly now is say some things about how I came to be interested in autism and classical myth. Um, there are so many things I could say here, so I'm just going to keep it as focused as possible. Um, I'll then say some things about um, how I've uh, taken a Herculean focus and um, some of the key things behind what I'm doing. And then we can lead into what Lisa and um, her colleague Ayelet are, are developing um, over in over in um, Israel. Uh, okay, so it, it all started for me um, a few years ago now, in 2008. Uh, I was in a meeting with a teacher, in a, uh, a special needs teacher in a secondary school in the UK. And when she found out that I'm a classicist, who's especially interested in myth, um, she shared with me something that has struck her and that has struck her colleagues as well over the years, namely that autistic children often really enjoy uh, finding out about classical myth. So I started to wonder why that might be the case. And then I started to think whether that there might be anything that I could do as a classicist who's passionate about myth and passionate about taking this <laughs> beyond the academy. I, I started to wonder if there's anything I could do here. And so I reached out to as many people as I could think, that I could think of, um, including in um, psychology, in drama therapy, in education at my university, Roehampton, um, and beyond, uh, in order to see if people thought I had some kind of viable topic here. 
and I kept getting really good feedback. And so uh, what I started doing back in early 2009, and I can include the link at the, at the end for this, I started blogging. Um, very aware that I didn't, I didn't know if this was going to go anywhere, but I thought if I can at least get my ideas out there and maybe get some feedback from people, and um, I could see where it, I could see where it all, where it all ended up. Um, and I did get really good feedback from people, um, people all over the world as well. Um, and I should say that one of the reasons why it's so great to be linking up here with Lisa is um, to try to get some sense of how, in different parts of the world, um, autism, how autism is perceived and how autism education is undertaken um, or does it, okay? Um, and that's you know very much one of the things that a claim is seeking to do, right? Really think about how, how things are done in specific parts of the world and how we can learn from other people and do things differently or do things in the same way, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so, I, so I, I made various connections. And then in about 2015, I linked up with um, Katarzyna Marciniak, um, who is a pioneering scholar of, uh, uh, was in children's culture, uh, very much to um, uh, take a focus on how classics have a place in autistic children's culture. We um, uh, teamed up with various other people, including, including Lisa and a colleague in Australia and a colleague in Cameroon, and we put together a bid to the European uh, Research Council, um, which was successful. And so I went from I went from having this dream of maybe one day doing something for autistic children based on classical myths to having a whole set of deadlines, right? <laughs> and having to do it. Um, and so uh, the amount of blogging I did started to escalate, and things moved on to a whole new level. Very much now under the wing of our our mythical childhood, and all the support and encouragement that that gave. And um, and what I did first was to decide on um, a particular mythological figure to focus on. And the figure I decided to focus on for all sorts of reasons, um, including the fact that he's what someone that's intrigued me for as long as I've been interested in, in mythology, um, it's the figure of Heracles or Hercules, okay? Um, and um, I could talk about this in an enormous amount of detail. I'm happy to ask, answer questions about this if people, if people want. But in very, very, very pared down terms, there's a lot um, of aspects of Hercules that can resonate with what it is to be autistic, um, including always having to learn the rules of a situation afresh. Hercules is someone who succeeds brilliantly. He learns how to um, learn the rules. He learns the rules for how to defeat the Hydra, defeat the Minion Lion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But no sooner has he mastered a particular situation Right, then he moves to a whole new situation and has to learn the rules all over again. And when I um, shared this and other things about Hercules with autistic people, one response, one response has been, "That sounds like being autistic." So I thought, "Yes, good." So, so, so my gut feeling was, um, was I think a good one. And um, what I'm actually doing with the activities uh, I've been developing for a while now, and I'm currently putting together into a into a book that should be out in the next year or so. Um, what I'm doing is focusing not just on Hercules, but even more specifically than that, um, on this particular um, artifact. Um, it's, act, it's a chimney piece panel, and here's me from about, 20, in about 2015, um, pointing to the panel uh, with a group of school children who were um, doing a program at Roehampton at the time. Uh, so, uh, it's, uh, Roehampton is full of neoclassical architecture, uh, Georgian villas, that kind of thing, including uh, one called Grove House that's just like five minutes walk away from where I am at the moment in my office at Roehampton. Uh, one of these, uh, uh, Grove House, uh, includes a room that's known as the Adam Room, uh, after Robert Adam. Adam did not design the room, it was designed by Wyatt very much after Adam. Okay, so it's very um, gorgeous neoclassical space, very much a showpiece room at the university. And its chimney piece, as you can see here, includes this very, very detailed uh, 18th century representation by the Carter workshop, again, not Adam, um, of 
well, whatever it is, you know, Hercules in the process of choosing or panicking as he's trying to choose between two uh, very different paths in life. One represented by one woman, hard work, something like that. One represented by another woman, pleasure, something like that. And, um, and I've, um, I'm focusing on this particular artifact for all sorts of reasons, including because there's so much here that can resonate with what it is to experience stuff as an autistic person. Um, entering new spaces, for example, trying to, be, trying to deal with too much information right, all at once, to quote the um, National Autistic Society in the UK's campaign from a few years ago, too much information. Um, whereas also, but also if you're autistic and detail orientated, there's so much you can focus on here. And that's something I'm very much trying to harness with the activities. Um, there's also so much potential here. Um, and this I think very much links with what Lisa's working on, emotions, right? So, you know, so a lot of lot of scope for thinking about the various emotions that Hercules is going through here. You know, it, has he gone, is he is he trying to it has he blanked out here? Um, is, is he feeling no emotions? Not unlikely. Or is he feeling lots of emotions all at once? Okay, right. So much so that he's gone into seeing shutdown. Um, there's also some, a lot of scope with dealing with choice making. This is the choice of Hercules, thinking about things like how the present can turn into the, into the future. There's also lots of opportunity here for thinking about different points of view. And um, one thing I was struck by when I was in this room, for example, uh, it's in this room, in this room with these children, for instance, who are all about 15, 16 at the time, um, none of them have had any formal encounters with anything classical, mythological, or otherwise. And what was interesting is that when they looked at the chimney sweep panel, unlike me, right, who has been interested in classics for some time, unlike me, they didn't see the man in the middle, right? That wasn't the focus for them. What was interesting for them was the women, right? And how the women were trying to, you know, to control their space and maybe vie with one another, perhaps for the man's attention. So um, there's, there's lots of opportunity for um, changing points of view and focusing on this woman, for example, or this woman, right? So it, uh, when I did an activity with a group of adults in an autistic cafe a few years ago, very interestingly, I gave people amongst other things, scissors, and one of them actually cut out their views, which is really, really interesting. Okay, and actually very much in line with the 18th century, where on some medals, for example, there's no Hercules, there's just this figure and this figure, right? So, we, so I, I love the idea of not just decentering, but also disappearing Hercules potentially. So there's loads of there's loads of um, there's loads of scope here. Um, just to say a few things, right? I've had some um, drawings specially made and an, and an animation as well by Steve Simons, who is um, amongst other things um, an animator and um, an artist as well. And um, so here's his um, line drawing um, of the scene as a whole. He's also, and I can perhaps talk about this if people want to, he's also done a closed version. Okay, well, I can, I'm happy to talk about, talk about that with people. Um, he's done an animation of the scene as well. I mean, potentially I could show that if people, if people wanted. Um, and he's also done some um, uh, details. That I'm using in the activities as well. This isn't this isn't even everything. Okay, these are just this is just some of them. And um, and okay, and uh, I, I I've done various workshops so far over the years um, on the activities um, it, it, over recent years using um, using Steve's drawings. Uh, I, I also take along all sorts of stuff here, uh, things like you know helmets, pencil, right, uh, uh, stickers. Right, even a even a guest book that I you know, wish I could like you know actually bring to you in person. But you know if you want to write things on my guest book, um, I'll be very happy to cut it out and paste it in. Um, and um, there's a lot of emphasis on color, on coloring in, and that's actually quite controversial in special needs education and children's education more broadly. I'm happy to I'm happy to talk about that if people if people would want. Um, now, when I first um, when I first uh, uh, designed a set of activities back in, I think it was 2018, early 2018, uh, as part of what, as, to meet one of my deadlines for the ERC project. Um, I designed a set of activities, but they were kind of a bit mad and all over the place because I was trying to do everything all at once. Um, and then since then, Lisa and Ilet have, um, have, I think, you know, very, in some ways built on 
or, or taken some kind of inspiration from from um, my my choice of Hercules, as it, as it were. Sorry, um, and they've designed um, a, a set of lessons very much um, for um, children in in Israel. Um, and uh, and I'm going to hand over to to Lisa now because one, because one thing I want to I want to I want to like perhaps end I'll end by saying is that so Lisa sort of built on what I was doing and but took things in a different in a different direction. I in turn have taken inspiration from what Lisa and Ilet have done um, in creating the, um, the final version of the of the activities. Um, so I think now that I'm showing some of these like coloured in by various by various people, it's an ideal time to um, hand over to Lisa because I think this is a really good segue. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, and uh, I just have to echo everything Susan said about the support we've had from from um, everybody. The the Children's History Society. It's so lovely for April to to approach us, and in general, uh, the whole ERC project has been you know, just so exciting to work with people so closely and to be stimulated and take ideas. I had no idea five years ago that I was going to be in the slightest bit uh, working on autism or interested in it, and it's absolutely gripped me. Um, as Susan said, some of the things she was beginning to produce really stimulated me um, and Ayelet as well my my colleague the wonderful Ayelet Pierre I, I will actually uh, share my screen now and show you some of the uh, things um, that we have been doing here and I'm going to start with a uh, photo of um, Ayelet herself she's the one in the middle let's just make this a full screen uh, Ayelet is the one in the middle here um, she is my colleague at Bar Ilan Dr Ayelet Pierre who's wonderful and next to her on the right here the gentleman <coughs> is Shahar Ben Yehuda and our first uh, thought when we first decided that this is something we really were excited by and wanted to get involved with was to approach the Israel Autism Society which at that time um, uh, Shahar was working uh, for them he's now doing some other things, but he's still very involved. And uh, he put us together with various schools that he worked with um, to where they have classes made up of special needs children, on the whole, autistic children, usually classes of around eight, um, who are in the school with the, the regular school mainstreamed, but do certain things separately and certain things with the, the rest of the, uh, the kids of their own age. Um, and he puts it in touch again with Pali Almagor, who you see um, on the other side of Ayelet, the, the child putting his fingers up behind, we're going to ignore at this moment because uh, we're not actually meant to show their faces at all. I don't think anybody will recognize him anyway. Um, but uh, Tali is amazing. Uh, she's the class teacher of an autistic class, a, a class of autistic children who are fifth and sixth grade. So we're talking about 10 and 11 year olds. Um, they are all boys. Uh, there are eight of them. And she is also herself very interested in myth. So sitting down with her, we began to develop a program and we decided that rather than focusing just on Hercules, as we did at the beginning, although that's a subject in itself, as Susan has shown, that we could really uh, deal with, uh, they thought it would be very beneficial to take some of the major issues that we see in classical mythology that deal with emotions because dealing with emotions and complex emotions is something that autistic children often find very tricky to analyze what it is they're feeling and how to deal with it. And we found that there were very parallel things going on in mythology. So I have to say, I did not run this program. Ayelet ran this program. She went into school on a Friday morning for every week for about 10 weeks until COVID intervened. Uh, COVID came along um, towards the end of the program, sort of two, two thirds of the way through the program. We did a few sessions on Zoom and in fact, there was such it was so successful that they asked for a continuation so we developed a part two which also then uh, ran and there was um, a couple of other special activities as well um, but it started out with this this one class and this one teacher um, and the idea of the uh, program i will show you now uh, was a, a based on pandora's box um, it's a journey a quest where the uh, children themselves become heroes and this is something very much identified with um, when uh, we talked to them about how it felt to be autistic. Um, they, the most common thing they came up with was it's special. They, they didn't feel underprivileged. They didn't feel deprived. They felt special and they identified with heroes. They saw the world in a different way, not a world's worse way as the heroes did. So we had a journey which was based around uh, the idea of Pandora's box and I'll explain it in one second. And it starts uh, with uh, the explanation here, which uh, explains that the collection of um, emotions, which had, in our version was in Pandora's box, had been scattered. And their jo job was to go and find each emotion and deal with it and put it back in the box, basically. 
Um, so it starts <coughs> with the box itself, and we have the the. Uh, this is a lovely presentation that Ayla herself put together. Um, we have uh, the whole um, description of the story itself. All, every time we told a story, and it was very interesting. The very beginning, one of the uh, pupils said that, uh, "Oh, I hate mythology." There were some who knew everything, were very excited, and one, I hate it, I hate mythology. And this was the one who at the end was desperate to, to continue. Uh, so may, I don't think he'd even admit that he now liked mythology, but he certainly identified with it and he loved the program and the activities. Um, so what it is, is you'll see here, we have a journey. Uh, each of these is the, the places they have to go to to collect the different emotions. And it starts out, uh, each time we have a clip. Um, I'm not gonna show you this one because it's a clip of Disney, but be showing because we'll get told off by Disney um, but the idea is that they welcome to the the party of the gods and from there they will go off and do their um, search uh, they explain the story of the golden apple and what happens and then they have their um, their own tasks to do and here we set down um, the rules uh, the ad administrative rules and we have here um, some very clear um, uh, descriptions and instructions about what to do. First of all, we have a description of what they are going to have to do. Um, and we're told that each time when they finish the level, uh, when they've conquered an emotion and they've collected it, then they will um, be on their journey again. So the first one we dealt with was jealousy, and that was to do with the golden apple, obviously. Um, we then progress. I'm just going to go very briefly through it. I'm not going to show each thing, but we get to the maze, for example. And each time, they have an activity to do, some kind of practical activity or craft activity and discussion. And from that, we they drew out their feelings about um, the emotion that was under underway. Uh, here we have, for example, a maze that they did. <coughs> and from there, we actually, the teacher built a maze in the classroom that they had to find their way through. Uh, this was her creating the maze. And we can hear them here solving the maze. They loved doing this. They really enjoyed it. And, um, and then there was a discussion about how do you think Theseus felt when he was in the maze, when he was facing the Minotaur, and the whole discussion about fear. Um, and uh, we had various pictures and discussions of it. And then they uh, were able to, at the end of this, to say that they had finished this stage and they had conquered fear. Um, and we had various emotions, as you can see, I'm not going to go through the whole thing because we have, it takes too long. Um, we've spent several weeks, we had Midas and that was um, uh, with his, uh, <laughs> the golden, uh, the golden uh, idea of shame, Midas's ears rather than the, the gold um, and, and uh, the feeling of shame. We had, um, next one, get to it, here we go, Narcissus. Um, was another story they very much enjoyed. We have the, the selfie idea here um, as well, and uh, the emotion here of pride or conceit. Uh, and each time we had um, um, Achilles and we talked about shame, for example, um, and uh, they very much uh, discussed how they felt at each time. For example, when we were discussing shame, here we have loneliness, which was Hercules. Uh, did you feel differently from other people? How do you cope with feeling alone? Um, and when we got onto shame, for example, or embarrassment, where well, they, they came up with very, they were able to verbalize very much how they felt. Uh, one of the children, a uh, sensitivity we have here with Pegasus, one of the children said that he feels embarrassed when he, he knows his father gets embarrassed when he lies on the floor and screams if they're in public. They were at really able to hone in on these emotions and see not only how they impacted on themselves, but how they impact on other people. Um, and um, they was very, I, I didn't actually go through the rules, but the rules of the game involve self-respect, respecting everybody else. It's a group activity. Nobody is allowed to go off and do their own thing. Anybody who shows any kind of physical or verbal violence is thrown off the game and they were desperate not to be thrown off the game. They behaved very well. Um, um, these are children who don't always find it easy to work together, but the emphasis was on cooperation and cooperative work. And um, I'll just go ahead to the end of the game. I know we don't have so much time. This was Agamemnon uh, and the idea here of uh, honor. Um, and here we come, we're nearly there. <laughs> this is the final one. They've got everything back in the box. They actually had a, um, a party and they went and released balloons in the sky. Uh, hope was the last thing that was actually there. And this was the end of the journey. Um, and they all got prizes, they got trophies. Each one is, is uh, written on um, uh, their own name um, and the journey that they'd gone through and what they'd accomplished. 
Uh, so we had um, very, very positive feedback, as I say, I'm going to stop sharing now. Uh, we have very, very positive feedback from the students and from the um, teacher as well. Um, we continued after that with the Titans journey uh, going on in with more, uh, more of the same, really. But they eat, she did feel that they'd got a great deal out of it. Um, we would like to do this, uh, it's already really to do in other countries, other schools, certainly in Israel, where we're in coordination with several others. Again, unfortunately, COVID kind of uh, put a, a slight delay on these things, but we are talking to various other teachers. Uh, but we'd love to spread it also elsewhere. We can translate everything from Hebrew to English, obviously, but it really is basically ready to go. And we'd be very interested in feedback as well um, of how um, it's been used, how it's been adapted, other ideas, um, what impact, if any, it's had. Um, because I think that we have here something that very much appeals anyway to autistic children, as Susan said, um, but particularly the idea of emotions was something we found very interesting to develop. Uh, so thank you to Susan. Uh, as I said, it was very much the inspiration. And she's very kind to say that we inspired her in some way. I'm not quite sure, but she's going to go and tell us a little bit more about that now, or at least pretend that we did. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's absolutely not, not pretense. Um, I, I absolutely love the work that um, Lisa and Ilet have, have done um, and to date I think we've done more than I have by way of actually going into going into schools so what I've done uh, what I've done so far is I've um, I've um, been uh, a couple of times into uh, a London uh, primary school and I think a bit, a bit like the school Lisa mentioned it's a school that has a specialist autism base uh, where some of the children are always in the autism base, like you know, very much separated out, card entry, that kind of thing, and break times from the rest of them. But some of them spend quite a lot of time or a little bit of time with, as they called it, mainstream, or if they always pointed up there's mainstream up there. Um, and so, um, so I've um, so I've um, done some of the activities uh, together with a research assistant. Um, Effie uh, in uh, a school in uh, part of London, and um, and then since now since lockdown things have got really interesting. I've really been trying to make most of the opportunities right, that having to do things remotely can can give us in ways that I think will translate to different ways of doing things once uh, the pandemic is is over, whenever whenever that will be. Um, so, for instance, having already done some things. Uh, linking, linking up with a local, a local theatre for the UK-wide Being Human Festival in the past. When that festival went um, online only for 2020, I proposed an event uh, um, as part of their autism, uh, part, sorry, as part of their um, um, Being Human Cafe series. I, I proposed Hercules Cafe, right? So, um, and, and um, that, that was accepted, that took place last October, October 2020. And um, anybody from the world could, could, could join in, which is like really interesting. And I did have people joining in from, from all over the place, including South Africa, Belgium, Poland, um, and the United States. Um, and even despite time zone differences, um, Australia as well, which was, um, which was super. And, um, and it was it was pitched at it was pitched at um, at uh, children specifically autistic children, but I stress that you know anybody could um, could take part. Um, and um, so I so things seem to be working via via Zoom as well. Um, and I think this this all, this this can give us an opportunity to do what I to to, to do what I um, said at the beginning and what Lisa has already mentioned. Uh, sorry, it was just mentioned. Uh, maybe we're really thinking about how the various activities we're doing translate into other countries and how things are done there. Because I mean, everything that Lisa's saying, like it could so work in the you know in the school I've been to, for example. And then next month, um, again to get right. So when um, Effie and I went into the school in our part of London, right, we were able to do it. Not least because Effie was based in in the UK at the time. She's now based back in Greece. But what we're going to do next month? is um, link up again and go into um, a, a school. The first school we went into was, uh, was, was a primary school. We're gonna go into a secondary school next month um, to work with the, the children there at their autism unit. Um, and we're gonna be doing it via Zoom. That's what the, that's, you know, that's, that's what the, the, school, the school wants. So that's gonna be a really interesting opportunity um, to um, you know, very much think about how these activities work 
um, when done remotely. And I'm, I'm currently finalising the lessons um, and um, uh, finalising them, not least for the, the book that I'm writing that collects them together and introduces them. And so what I'm, what I'm now aiming to do is to include, include a session on how these might work as online activities. Right. And then we could like, really harness the opportunities of you know, connecting with people all over the place. And I've had offers of people to translate them into other languages as well. So there's so much, you know, there's so much, um, there's so much potential. Um, so one of the one of the things that I felt really inspired by um, when I read a draft of some of the things that um, Lisa and I were doing, um, it, it really enabled me to think about how um, rather than trying to do everything at once, right, <laughs> think for the activities, um, you know, just, you know, in, let people immerse themselves in what myth is, because autistic people often you know, love fantasy, they love things like westerns, video games, they love immersing themselves in different spaces, right, and classical myth can be one of those spaces, so I was trying to immerse people in that, and trying to get people to think about the potential of colour, emotion, thinking about the future, <laughs> learning about myth, even, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, I was trying to do everything at once, right? And there is there is scope for that, but I think it was all a bit too mad. But but it needed to be at first. And then it was reading how um, what Lisa and I was doing that was so brilliantly wide ranging, but so very focused. I love that interplay. And that then enabled me to see clearly what I needed, what I needed to do. Um, I'm not going to, um, sorry, I forgot I wasn't sharing screen so I can see it all here. I'm just going to share screen just briefly again. Um, so yeah, so this is where, um, this is where we got to before where I was um, showing some of the colouring in that, that people have, have done. I'm, I'm very happy to give a bit of context and say who the people were who coloured in and, and why they did it and why um, if people, if people want it. But what I wanted to, so what I will show briefly if it will let me good yeah um okay so um what i'm um what i um what i've done very much inspired by lisa and i let's work and also by the feedback i got um from the from the, from the primary school and from um, other people I've, I've i've worked with and also people at the human event last year um i've divided things very much into into clear cut lessons there are 10 lessons in total um, they're all very much linked with aspects of, of um, this particular you know, episode that I've mentioned, I've mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, what happens, what happens is that the, each lesson has, um, has uh, four steps. Okay. Um, to begin with, uh, I get some, now I, I do it when obviously when I, when I do things with, with people, but um, you know, hopefully people, uh, teachers and others will be able to um, use the lessons um, without me. <laughs> um, so I start off with uh, this. I took this is very much something I took inspiration from from one of the teachers I was I was working with at the school in London. Um, she started off by taking things out of her bucket that were going to be relevant to the lessons that she had that she was going to be teaching, and the kids got so excited they so wanted to know what was going to be in the bucket. So I now have. Um, well, it was, it was actually a, a linen basket I bought from um, um, a local supermarket, but I called it my amphora, right? I called it the amphora um, because that's classical, and there is an amphora in the in the in the scene, right? So it's all it's all very relevant. So, um, so I outline what she, what people could put in the amphora, which could include um, amongst other things, you know, um, you know here's a, a printout of one of um, Steve Simon's drawings, for example. Um, it could be it could be other other relevant objects as well. It could even be things like you know swords, that kind of thing. Um, the victory, <laughs> thinking what we least said, little cuts, that kind of thing. So there's all sorts of possibilities. And I, I make and I make very clear what should be in the what what should be or what could be in the amphora. Um, it's all very much about um, being adaptable as well. Um, so step one, what's in the amphora? Step two, talk about something um, relevant to the to the particular um, um, aspect. Um, of the lesson. Oh, and the lessons can also be done in any order, right? That's another thing I've been, I, that's one thing I didn't, I didn't do previously. So it means that, you know, if teachers just want to do one, right, very much linked with um, a particular issue, such as emotions, present into future, entering new spaces, they can, they can do that. They can treat it in a very sort of social stories kind of way, if they, if they want to. And social stories as developed by Carol Gray have been so instrumental in autistic children's um, um, education and, and learning and support, that kind of thing. 
Um, all, the, all, all of their things can be done as an overall, as an overall program. And that's something I've been very much tried to stress in the book. And so one of the challenges for me has been to present things that could all link up or can be done just very much in, you know, well, one at a time, um, et cetera, or can be done in any order. Um, so always amplify then talk about whatever the particular issue is. Then people get to have their turn, right, which could be um, colouring in, et cetera. I can say more about that if people want. And then you do something more complex, right? You talk about you know what her keys might be in feeling, for example, and how that might relate to a particular experience that um, you know, people in the class might want to have had. Um, and so what I've put here is just the it's the it's the introduction to um, one of the lessons, number six of, of ten, um, and um, and it's focusing on uh, one particular stage in the story. What pleasure is maybe saying to her keys. Um, so, it, so it's got a it's got a classical dimension, but it's also um, uh, linking with a particular topic that's very relevant to um, what it is to be autistic, namely enjoying things, right? Having sort of special interests, um, for instance. Um, and each time um, I give uh, a brief introduction, this is still very much in, in draft form. So, if there are any typos, I apologise. If anyone's got any suggestions, I would very much like to hear them. Um, and I always say what the, um, um, as my daughter said, the success criteria are <laughs> for, each, for each lesson. Um, and e each one's divided, divided in the same way, right? Each one talks about how students will have the opportunity to know about something, to explore something in particular, and to then to talk about certain things. Um, so it's very much you know, about Hercules and classical myth, but it's very much also using Hercules and myth as a vehicle for engaging with what it is to be autistic, both um, experiencing things that can be classed as difficulties um, because society um, disables autistic people, um, but also um, fitting with what Lisa said, it's to give the children an opportunity to be autistic and enjoy um, experiencing the world as autistic people. And look, I've just got one very last slide, which is just this. If, um, um, because you know you can't end a PowerPoint presentation there's there's, there's those links and things. Um, so you know that's how I'm contactable. Um, that's a link to the blog I mentioned, the one is, I started in 2009 and have kept going ever since. Um, here's a link to our acclaimed website that was launched just last month. Sorry, my sense of time has gone a bit like weird thanks to the pandemic, but yeah, we launched it to coincide with um, Autism Awareness Week for uh, 2021. And there's a link to the you know, wider Army of People Childhood um, website. Um, so that's everything I was going to say. I'm just going to, um, if I can remember how to do it, actually stop sharing. Um, so, um, yeah, that's everything I was going to say. I don't know if there's anything more you want to say, Lisa. No, I think we've sort of covered it, and I think we've gone way over the time that we're asked. <laughs> For. So I think we, we will uh, leave it there. Um, and um, Maybe I'll also add my uh, email address and uh, contact details so that people can uh, get in contact with us if they're interested in a particular part of the programme. But uh, thank you again uh, very much for inviting us. It's a pleasure and looking forward to actually being at the conference, even if it's only virtually. Bye.